Have you ever had one of those weeks where the little things really added up? Sometimes, for the Christian, these bumpy weeks are more challenging to react to properly because we think that we can just press on, focus in, make a plan, and then everything will smooth itself out. Generally, we end up wasting a bunch of time trying every avenue we can think of to take care of ourselves before we realize that we need to give our circumstances over to God. Kind of silly, right? And if you think about it, in terms of faithfulness, it's almost easier to be faced with some large looming crisis where there's no fooling ourselves into thinking we've got it under control. We go to God immediately. We're forced to trust God wholly because the only other option we have is despair. But shouldn't we be doing that every day? How does a Christian hold to their faith despite changing circumstances? What do we need regularly to keep us going strong for Christ? I want to focus this morning on a key element of the Christian life that we may often take for granted, encouragement. Maybe you've had a rough week or year. Maybe things are fine. You need encouragement. You need encouragement because life takes courage. And because the encouragement that we find in Scripture changes us. Ponder that for a moment. God's word can change you. And it will change you for the better if you give it its proper place in your life. We're going to look at some of Paul's writing to a church that was actually doing pretty well and see why he made encouragement such a focus. And in seeing what the truth of God's word means for us, I pray that we will be changed, that we will grow in our love for God and be spurred on to a renewed walk of faith and a desire to go to God continually, no matter where we are in life. And pray with me for a moment. God, your word is living and active. Your word is what we need to guide us, to rule over us. Pray that your word would be spoken by your spirit and that our hearts would be open to hear it this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. When Paul wrote to the Thessalonians, he was concerned mainly with one thing. How was their faith holding up? See, when the crowd in Thessalonica made such an uproar, the church feared for Paul and Silas' safety. So they sent them away, almost like the story of Paul being sent away in the basket at the beginning of his ministry. It was quickly, suddenly, urgently. They were sent away. And having been separated from this fledgling church due to the violent opposition of the Jews, Paul and Silas were prevented from returning to their new converts to, as Paul puts it, provide what is lacking in your faith. Paul had received an encouraging report after sending Timothy, but he could not help but continue to reach out, offering what he could by sending letters. These letters, 1st and 2nd Thessalonians, are mainly letters of encouragement. Far from suspecting that the Thessalonian church has fallen away, Paul has heard reports from far and wide about their faith and witness. So why then do they need encouragement? And why might we? Isn't encouragement the thing we do when someone is having a rough go of it? When they're discouraged? Or when they're two years old and they actually get the bristles of the toothbrush to touch their little baby teeth? <laughs> Isn't it one of those acts of pity or condescension that we know is kindly meant, but don't always enjoy receiving. We often view encouragement as an arm around the shoulder, as an, it'll be all right, or a good job. And it is just that. To encourage is to give support, confidence, or hope. But it is more than that. 
To encourage is also to give support and advice to someone so they will continue to do something, as well as to help or stimulate an activity, state, or view. Doesn't that sound like something we need more than just when we're discouraged? To this Thessalonian church that has not had years to grow and mature, but through whom the Holy Spirit is working mightily to witness to the gospel of Christ, Paul writes because he knows what it is to be a Christian. He knows that even when God is using you mightily, at the end of the day, you're still human. And that being human means that this life is more than you can handle on your own. The Thessalonians received the word with the joy of the Holy Spirit, as we read in the beginning of Paul's first letter. But they also received it in affliction. Affliction is not a word we often use these days. It means suffering. And we're familiar with suffering. Suffering is something that might well cause someone who loves us, even someone who knows that our faith is strong, to be concerned with how we're doing. Hopefully, it will cause a Christian brother or sister to reach out, to offer aid, or to bring to us what the Spirit has revealed to them about how we might weather the storm and remain faithful to Christ throughout. First in Thessalonians are letters written to help the people of God weather the storm. Paul begins his first letter in the classic style with a formal greeting and an expression of thanksgiving to God regarding the recipients of his letter. And perhaps we may feel as we read that this piece of writing to another people at another time, in another place, may be hard to apply to us directly. Paul is not thanking us. He's not talking about our circumstances. But in giving thanks to God for the faith and the witness of the Thessalonians, Paul makes a statement that has echoes throughout Scripture, a statement that anchors both these letters of encouragement and much of our gospel hope. Paul writes, We give thanks to God for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers loved by God, that he has chosen you. He has chosen you. God has chosen you. What does it mean to be chosen by God? Does it mean that our choices don't matter? No. Scripture plainly holds forth our acceptance or rejection of Christ as our responsibility. It is the basis upon which our lives will be judged. But somehow, God's, God's omniscience and sovereignty are upheld even in how humans react to his lordship and his message of repentance and obedience. And I won't stand here and pretend to have the quick and easy guide to how God works. The Bible is as close as we get to God for dummies. And the depths of God's words are sometimes incredibly intimidating, especially when you're standing before a congregation and speaking on a difficult subject. And so I'm left with this. Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, wrote to the Thessalonians that God chose them. Paul also wrote the same to the Ephesians and to the Romans. Peter wrote it to the churches. And Christ said the same thing to his disciples. Jesus said, you did not choose me, but I chose you. I can't explain how it works, but I can trust that it does because we're talking about God. God's desire is that all will be saved, but not all will be chosen. Not all will respond to the Spirit heed the truth, and turn from their rebellion. But those who do will receive all that is theirs in Christ. And it is glorious. But why does it matter? 
Why ought we marvel at being chosen by God? Why did Paul build so much of his letters to the Thessalonians around it? How does it provide for us the nourishing encouragement for our faith that we need, not just when we're in the midst of affliction, but at all times? Let me share with you this morning three reasons why being chosen by God is perhaps the most encouraging truth of Scripture. First, being chosen by God means that our lives are not our own. What? That's encouraging? Many in the world would call that offensive. Our sinful nature, which ultimately desires to be God, rebels against such a statement. But let's look at what this means, both spiritually and practically. Spiritually, Scripture makes it plain why our lives are not our own. Ephesians 2 begins, And you were dead in your transgressions and sins. Dead. Before Christ, we had no spiritual life for ourselves or anyone else. The state of our souls was already lost, destroyed by the curse of sin that we both inherit as members of the human race and willingly enter into by our sinful deeds. But think of what God has done. God walked into the morgue where our dead soul was on ice and said, give me that one. I can use them. And how did he use us? By bringing us back to life. Continuing on in Ephesians 2, but God, such a great phrase, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. God brought us back to life, not because we deserved it, but because he loves us. And it wasn't free. We don't get to say it's no big deal. In Acts 20, Paul tells the elders at Miletus, that the church that God had put them over was obtained with his own blood. 1 Peter 1 states that we were ransomed. And Paul puts it plainly to the Corinthians. You are not your own. You were bought with a price. Consider the price Jesus paid for you. And consider how being purchased by the Lord should affect the direction of your life. I hope that we can see that our lives in Christ not being our own is both a fact and a wonder. If we can get past our own rebellious nature to see what God was willing to do for us, to grasp what it means for us eternally, it ought to cause us to bow in worship before a master whose lordship is the best thing we could ever hope for. The spiritually dead destined to die eternally, but made alive by the power of God. Praise the Lord. What about practically? Well, practically, our lives not being our own means it's not all on us. We know, and we have proven to ourselves time and again that we cannot control the world around us. All our capacity and effort can't add more minutes to the day. No matter how tough we think we are, a microscopic organism can kill us, despite thousands of years and millions of man hours dedicated to preventing such things. We can't even live up to our own expectations for ourselves, much less change anyone else. Why would we want to be in charge? Why would we want to be saddled with having to figure out what is right? and good, and healthy, all on our own. Thankfully, for those chosen by God, those raised to new life in Christ, we don't have to face that problem. We are his, and he has shown us through his word how we are to live. Not only that, but this realization that our life is not our own opens us up to another truth. Our battles are not our own. The pressure to make ends meet 
It's not on you. The constant struggles you face with your failing health is not a measure of your worth. Stress is not about you. Loneliness is not about you. Conflict and trauma are not about you. All these things involve you and surround you and bring choices before you, and they certainly affect you. But you are part of something bigger than yourself. You are part of the kingdom of God, where God not only sets the direction, but also provides for you the means by which you can do what he commands. Brothers and sisters, whether we realize it or not, we are caught up in the heavenly current of what our loving God and Father is doing to glorify his name through fallen people in a broken world. God takes care of our needs because he loves us, but also because our needs are not to be our priority. We are kingdom builders, and the way we build that kingdom here on earth is by letting God take control of everything we are and everything we face. It is by saying, it's not about me. It's about you, God. How can I serve you and honor your name now? How much better to let the current carry us rather than fight it? How much better to surrender to what God is doing in our lives and watch his power work through us to finally admit that we are weak and let God be shown as the omnipotent deity that he is. Your life is not your own. You've been bought with a price. And you've been bought for a purpose. This brings us to our second reason to be encouraged. God's choosing us means that we can live holy lives. That is our purpose. Look at how Paul anchors 1 Thessalonians with three prayers. The first is the passage of thanksgiving in chapter 1, where Paul gives thanks for the Thessalonians' work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope. Paul thanks God for the Spirit's conviction in their lives, for their imitation of his self and ultimately Christ, and for their powerful witness to the gospel. This is what Paul is thankful for. In the second prayer found in chapter 3, Paul prays, May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all his saints. The third prayer closes out the body of the letter in chapter 5. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your whole spirit and soul and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those are some big prayers. High praise in chapter 1. And how about those ideals in the other two? Blameless? In holiness? Wow. Sounds like quite a lofty aspiration for the people of God. Well, it's more than an aspiration. It's a requirement. Look at 1 Thessalonians 4. Paul, in exhorting the Thessalonians to continue on in service to God, writes, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. Sanctification is literally the act or process of making something or someone holy. Paul makes this plain a few verses later, saying, For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. And Paul says that that is God's will for his people. That we would be made, that we would become holy. Why ought we be holy? Going back to our first point, because our lives are not our own. Peter writes... As he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. After which he quotes the book of Leviticus, which states multiple times that Israel is to be holy because God is holy and because he called them out from among the peoples. We carry that same history as those called to Christ 
from the world. That same impossible to repay debt of gratitude and that same charge. So how do we live it out? How can we be holy? First, listen. We can be holy because in Christ we already are holy. In the economy of the heavenly, we are holy because the blood of Christ has cleansed us of all unrighteousness. In order to be free from the wages of sin, from death, we needed to be made clean. And Jesus did it. From 2 Corinthians 5.21, For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Holiness requires righteousness. The quality of being morally just or justifiable. We are not morally just. But because of Christ, we are morally justifiable. Before the judgment seat of God, it is Christ that is our plea. And that plea is sufficient. Second, we can be holy because salvation is not a one-time event. Sanctification is not 20 minutes at the car wash and off you go, shining like the sun. As we go through life, failing to be righteous over and over again, God is right there, offering forgiveness and cleansing again and again. Now, this doesn't mean that if you sin five seconds before you die and didn't confess, then you're out of luck. But rather, again, there is a spiritual and a practical reality to the Christian life. Or you might look at it as a positional and a practical reality. Positionally, in a spiritual sense, we are holy, righteous, and already seated in the heavenlies with Christ. That is how God views the follower of Christ. But practically, the proof of our spiritual state is played out as we fail time and again in this life. It is proved as we continue seeking the help that God offers us to be conformed day by day to the image of Jesus, our model for a holy life. Because God has chosen us, we're not trying to grasp at uncertainties. He calls us to be holy, and he gives us what we need to be holy. He places the expectation on us, an expectation that is impossible for us alone, but an expectation that is already fulfilled in him. When we accept him as Lord and turn and follow him, you can live a holy life, not absent sin, but free from its power to rule over your heart from its shackles that hold you back from fulfilling your God-given purpose, from its ability to separate you from God. Finally, the third reason that being chosen by God is so encouraging is that you can rest in knowing your future. Think of that. Rest. Sounds good, doesn't it? Who's planning on a Sunday afternoon nap? But isn't it so much of our restlessness, our fear and anxiety, our stress, aren't these things often based in not knowing the future or maybe forgetting that we do? In Paul's letters to the Thessalonians, perhaps the most prominent theme is the return of Christ called the coming of the Lord or the day of the Lord. Paul dealt with this topic in both letters because apparently the Thessalonian church had some pretty serious concerns, even though it seems that Paul had already taught them about it while he was with them. Paul is not harsh, but he is direct in placing before this church a very clear understanding of what they needed to know. In 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul makes it clear that the Christians who die will not miss out on Christ's return, but rather will be in the center of the action rising from the dead to meet their Lord in the air, a delegation sent out to meet their approaching king. In 1 Thessalonians 5, in talking about the Christian attitude of sober readiness for Christ's return, 
Paul makes another powerful statement from verses 9 and 10. For God has not destined us for wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we might live with him. And then in verse 11, 11 he says, Therefore encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. This is a direct message of encouragement. You are not destined for wrath, Christians. It is reinforced in Paul's second letter and echoes throughout Scripture. God desires to dwell among his people, to gather them to his self, and give them the ultimate blessing of his presence. And he will do so. Now, this can be a hard piece of encouragement to apply in the middle of the struggles of life. Knowing our heavenly future doesn't keep the lights on and the gas tank full, after all. But again, these trials, seemingly huge and insurmountable hurdles placed in front of us, can consume so much of our attention and hold our heart in thrall to fear and worry. And yes, this life takes work. But remember that your purpose is not to fight your own battles. Making the rent every month is not how you succeed in life. We are here to bring honor and glory to God through holy lives that bear witness to the life-changing gospel of Christ. When we frame our lives according to that truth, it changes how we see our circumstances. Remember that the Thessalonians received the word in much affliction. Now, listen to what Paul writes to the Corinthians concerning affliction. From 2 Corinthians 4, verses 17 and 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. That is a perspective that is very encouraging to our frail hearts. And beyond that, we do have promises for the day to day. As I said, God provides for us the means by which we can do what he commands. We know from Peter that the power of God has given us everything we need for life and godliness, a truth that transcends bank accounts, relational struggles, and sickness. Christ tells us that the yoke he has given us to bear is easy, and the burden we are to carry is light. We know that this is so because Christ is on that yoke with us, doing most of the work. And Christ is under that burden with us, carrying most of the weight. Christ says plainly that he will care for us, better than the birds of the air and better than the lilies of the field. And we have been given a clear direction and assurance from our Lord concerning anxiety. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things that is all the needs of today will be added to you because God has chosen you you can know where this is all headed you can know that it's all worth it that it was all in his hands you can know that he was tracking that curveball that took you by surprise and you can know that the pothole in the road that jarred you so badly didn't even cause a ripple in his coffee cup. You can know that when all is said and done, the things that you couldn't fix or that just weighed on you will be taken care of. That God will wipe away every tear from the eyes of his children. That is an encouraging thought. So how ought we to receive this encouragement? Hopefully, as the Thessalonians received the gospel. Hopefully, as you received the gospel. 
with joy, but also with conviction. How often do we forget that we are chosen by God? That it is God's doing that has brought us to a knowledge of the truth? That our lives are not our own? If you've served in the military, you know how important serial numbers are to the government of the United States. It is no small thing to lose a piece of gear stamped with one of these numbers, because that number means property of the United States government. How much worse to take the property of God and squander it on vanity. Consider the things that you are trying to achieve in your life and how you are spending your time. It's not really yours. Consider, how often do we doubt that we can live holy lives? Do we truly think that God is not able to work righteousness in us? When we make excuses for our attitudes, our bad habits, our laziness, we are not only ignoring God, and who God has called us to be, but we are telling the world that we don't think he's powerful enough to overcome our sin. He's already overcome your sin. Stop believing the lie that you are the exception to the gospel's power. Stop walking away from the fight because it's not easy. This is warfare. Take up your armor that God has provided for you and fight. Fight for righteousness because the victory is certain. Do we live like the victory is certain? Do we live like we know the outcome? Living in light of eternity ought to have a great impact on how we live out each day. It ought to be foundational to how we raise our children. It ought to govern where we go, what we invest our energy in, and what we do with our money. If we are in Christ, it ought to be a constant source of peace amidst the trials of life. And it should bring praise even in the midst of tears. For our Lord is victorious, conquering every stronghold and bringing the whole creation to its knees to declare that Jesus is King to the glory of God the Father. God knows where you're at. And he knows what you need. If you are here and you are not one of God's chosen, but you want to be, you want to accept salvation and rest in the promise of God, would you seek someone out after the service and talk to them about it? Many in this room would be thrilled to pray with you. Or maybe you are a follower of Christ, but you're feeling the pains of living in this world or you've been getting off track, and you know it's time to correct course, please bring your needs to the Lord and let your church family come alongside you. We are here to bear each other's burdens. Perhaps you don't feel like you're being afflicted. Your life might not be in crisis, but every person in this building, from the youngest to the oldest, is facing a life and a calling that requires us to humble ourselves and ask for help. We need God's spirit to work in us, and we need fellow Christians to bring encouragement and support for our faith. This is my encouragement to you this morning. Christian, God has chosen you. Your life and your battles are not your own. You can live a holy life, and you can rest knowing that your future is in God's hands. Let that spur you on to joyful obedience and renewed faith as you face whatever life throws your way. Let's allow the Lord to work in our hearts as we pause for a moment of quiet reflection.